Good afternoon. Uh, for afternoon, it's a little bit early, I think, but uh, I hope you had a good lunch. Um, I welcome you here to um, the panel about getting more design done. So, um, uh, let's make a short introduction so that you know with whom you will talk now. Um, uh, I will shortly start. I will uh, moderate this panel. Uh, my name is Andreas Zuika. I'm working as an evangelist um, at Epic uh, for the Western Euro uh, Europe area. My background is uh, game development, so I was game designer and creative director on several games. Uh, one of the most famous ones was uh, Settlers. I was working on Settlers uh, 4, 5, and 6, a strategy game from Germany. I worked on an Anno game for console. My last game was done with Unreal Engine. It was called The Long Journey Home, and now I ended up here. Um, and uh, the next is uh, this nice guy beside me. Yeah. So. Hi, uh, my name is Arcade, and uh, I've been in the industry for a bit over 10 years. And um, a year ago, I started the studio Neon Giant, um, which is now obviously an Unreal, um, Unreal Technology studio. But uh, back in the day, I worked at uh, People Can Fly, who became Epic Poland. Uh, I moved over there to Epic HQ and did a stint there for a short while. Um, but I actually left during the development of Unreal 4 because I wanted to make games. I didn't want to help other people make games. And <laughs> now I'm here. Uh, but so I did get the opportunity to work on Bulletstorm and Gears of War. After that, I worked on uh, five Wolfenstein titles. And after a while, I wanted to do something new. So here I am. Okay, so next. Uh Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, yeah, I've been in the industry about 15 years, a decade of which has been in various different Unreals. Um, currently at Danbuster Studio we're in Nottingham, where we're using Unreal, but it's unannounced. That's why it's just got a logo on it, because I can't really talk about it, but we can talk about the technology and everything that's on there. Um, my other Unreal games are Fable the Journey, which was Connect only at Lionhead on UE3, and then the um, obviously doomed Fable Legends, which I spent a lot of time on. But that, that's about all the unreal ones I've got. Okay, and then we have Peter. Okay, um, ooh, this is working. Okay, yeah. um, so I'm Peter Ackerall. I'm a lead programmer at uh, Tarsia Studios, uh, pretty much using Unreal for everything. Uh, been in the industry since 2006. Um, generally, I'm an AI programmer, so I often work with designers and animators um, to get stuff done. Um, been using Unreal since Unreal 3, and um, yeah, I've seen it used in lots of interesting ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, as I said, our topic is to talk about how to get more design done, and we are talking a little bit about the, um, this uh, interesting uh, gap, or this interesting area between programming, artist, game design, and what tools are there. So um, I, I would kick off with a question about um, the different design roles, because Michelle, for example, just said um, your title is, can you say it again? Um, I'm the lead technical designer at Dan Busters. So who of you is working in a company who has a technical designer? Okay. Well, that's more than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your, what's your role? So what can you can you de describe a little bit more precise what you do? Yep, cool. So um, at Dan Busters in the technical design department, we act as the bridge between all departments, not just code and design, everyone, and try and translate between all the many different languages and philosophies our teams have. We provide blueprints, not just for the game, but for tools, for art and everything, and generally just try and make things run as smooth as possible in a nice, maintainable way. So hopefully we should have a lot less bugs. Happy designers, because they don't have to fix a billion bugs at the end of the project in six different ways. Um, happy game design, because they should have some nice, easily exposed data to allow them to balance and tweak to their heart content without having to worry about breaking anything in the wider system. And happy coders, because they actually get the words that make sense to their head brains <laughs> instead of trying to translate it themselves. So. It's just, yeah, glue between everyone. Um, I saw your talk yesterday, and it's the first time I've sort of wanted to do a standard ovation. It's like, I've been trying to do this for a long time. But um, being a programmer, it's often quite difficult to try and get design to do various things. And what you were doing, it was like, oh, that's amazing. That's exactly what I want to happen. Yeah. So Ho hopefully, really we should alleviate that so everybody's yeah, happy. Yeah, exactly. Instead of just it. frustrated when we're not speaking the same language. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've worked at, I think, six studios in four engines on X titles, and I've never worked with someone actually being a technical designer. I've worked with designers who are technical. I'm a designer who is technical, but never had a title, never worked with it. I kept hearing about I kept hearing about, oh no, they have a technical designer doing the vehicles. They have a technical designer, like, it makes sense. Never happened in my entire career. 
Okay, that's interesting. I started 20 years ago, was hired from the test department at Blue Byte. Um, um, someone came in our test department and asked if someone can code, and I was bold enough to say, yes, me. <laughs> um, so they put me in front of a PC and said, you can script the thing here in Lua. And so I <laughs> got a book of Lua, like literally a book, and reading that and trying to do that. And then they hired me, but they didn't have really a position like game designer. So I was hired as data wizard. Um, so my first job were actually building the version. So I got the art, um, I checked everything. So if uh, I had to rename a lot, like uh, Lumberjack was, in, in the code it was woodcutter, and uh, in the art it, well, all the files <laughs> were named Lumberjack, and we're talking about 1,500 uh, animation uh, single frames. So it was my job to rename them and do all that, and that led to something I was, I was heading the data of the game. And that is how I got into game design. So for me, it was different. It was really like I always were kind of responsible for the data in the game, for all games I did. So um, who of you here is, uh, is a game designer? OK, who of you is kind of a jack of all trades? OK, that's a lot. Who of you is a programmer? Who of you is an artist? Who is business? OK. I'm data. That's Sorry? <laughs> Anyone other? Miscellaneous? <laughs> there, there we go, one other. <laughs> um, uh, so, as said, we have, do we have a mic runner here? So if you have any question, just raise your hand. I really want to encourage you to do this uh, as interactive as possible, um, because it will be more fun for you instead of us just talking about random things. If you have a question right now, I think that's a, uh, that's a good point. So. Technical designer, so where, where is the sweet spot for you between, so when becomes, Michelle, when becomes you, when do you hand over to a programmer or when do you hand over to some other department? So where is the... It's um, used by a case by case basis. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a case of it's programming and it's all just them and they're never involved with us again. It's not like that. It's, um, it's all very cooperative. So we may never hand over to a programmer. We may do with some systems like the you know, movement of player straight to code, we don't even get involved, complicated, better off in C++, faster. Mm -hmm. Lots of bugs that we don't have to fix, they, they can have that, but other gameplay systems, it, it's all very collaborative. You'll generally have a code base and a coder that works on that particular system. There'll be a TD that works on that system with them. We'll do scrums where the design are involved. Design will come and sit at our desks and prototype with us, play it, suggest changes. We'll go back, we'll review it. We'll decide at review, should, should some things go to code, should they not? Sometimes we take code and put it back in Blueprint because it works better. It, it, go, it goes in all directions and we just generally sit there and try and make everyone happy. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, that's sort of the way we want to do things as well, where it's a case of design have a great idea. We want to then go, okay, how can we make this viable? We've heard, I've been on so many projects where it's like, we're just going to prototype this in Blueprints, but we'll get around to doing, uh, doing it in code before we ship the project, and then we never do. Um, so a lot of the time now, it's a case of let's just sit down. What's the feature? What do we need? And um, watching the Blueprint talk earlier where, um, I, I've forgotten, who, who was presenting it? Sure. Um, he was just saying, this is what we think is a prototype, and then you see how quickly it expands. And a lot of the time, because a designer or an artist or someone isn't thinking about that, but then the programmer's often there going, but this is going to break here, there, we need a solution for this, and just um, having that collaboration very early on just really helps prevent a lot of bugs. Yeah, it does. The, the best thing you can do as a studio is talk to all of your departments mm. together. Just, 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 just talk. I mean, we have thousands of emails that go around. We use um, Mattermost in our office for quick communication as well, but I still prefer the stand up and come to my <laughs> desk and talk to me. It, it just, it's, it's easier. But there's, all, <clears throat> there's also the, the pace of development to consider, because uh, we are a small studio now. I uh, work for everything from Tiny to Mega. Uh, but Neon Giant in particular, we are uh, 10 people in the office and then we have a bunch of people externally. But uh, we, the, let's call us con content creators, right? The, the non-programmers, uh, we, we are just brute forcing a game. We are making a game and the programmer's job is to try and catch up and C++ <laughs> as much as you can. But we are going to keep making a game because we can't let... Uh, we, we don't want to have bottlenecks in the way of, oh no, I, I need to sit on my ass now and wait for this to be made in code. So 
there are very few things that we started out with in code. We, we have pretty much everything in Blueprints because it works. Mm -hmm. And then we realize, you know, also to ship on all platforms, et cetera, there's going to be some more work and some different work, but we never want to stand still. So it's a prototype, but with a disclaimer of we might ship. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's up to you guys. And it's actually more up to the programmers to tell me, you know what, let me take that one from you because I can do it better. You know, I can do it smoother, mm -hmm. better to expand. Sure, but I'm going to start building something else. Yeah. So what, what I can say, I, I worked with own engines. So Settler 6, for example, was complete own engine or like library of a lot of things. Um, so for our challenge in game design where it was a systemic game, so we had a lot of rules, but for nearly everything, the workflow was like we analyzing, researching other games, figuring out what we want to do, making a decision on paper, writing it down, sitting down <laughs> with a programmer, implementing it, going back and forth. And what I really love with, with Unreal, with Long Journey Home, which, which was the last commercial game I did, so that's more, my most recent um, memory of that, uh, experience with that, is it exchanged the blueprints and how you can make a game a completely exchanged, uh, uh, exchanged the whole process of producing any paper. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do something, you can actually make it. And then this is a documentation, you show it to a programmer, you say, oh my God, okay, we have to do this proper, but I get what you want to do. Yeah. And uh, it's already done in a way, all this kind of testing, figuring out mm -hmm. if it works, is already done before. So which tools would you say is, uh, you're using most in your work? Unreal Engine? Yeah, but I mean more <laughs> the, the tools within Unreal Engine. So is there some specific things where you say, okay, I spend most of my time there. So for example, I spend a lot of time in, um, uh, in basically in blueprints, but also a lot uh, in making the, the interface um, so that we're actually some, some big parts, but then we also made an own dialogue tool uh, as an external thing. And so I, I would like to know a little bit what is your kind of tool, tool set you are using. Your I spent Army most of my knife. time in um, our mission system that we made, which is a, a little in editor plugin um, on top of it, which it, it uses um, blueprints um, that we make and you can connect them together to create the mission flow. But you can see it, um, for those of anyone that's ever used CryEngine, it's a bit like flow graph, a bit like level script, but it's not in level script. It can be used anywhere, so it's not, it's not unique and you can reference it from anywhere, but you get to see a good flow through the mission, which is um, good for the level designers when you're trying to balance things and do it, but because it's in engine as well, it's directly there, so it's easy to tweak. You don't have to keep going back to a different program and looking at it, so it's, it's really nice that it's in there. And mm -hmm. obviously, Blueprint interfaces spend a lot of time in them too. <laughs> Yeah, um, we Visual Studio on the real engine, like yourself. Um, yeah, we like to use the diff tools quite a lot just to make sure what's going on and what's changed sometimes. Um, but yeah, we use quite a few plugins to try and make general communication throughout Blueprint a little bit easier. Um, and one of the things we've added on is um, essentially a global blackboard for us to use for design to be able to dump global variables or variables to be communicated. We named it the chalkboard to stop confusion with the behavior tree blackboard. But that's been something which we've used quite a lot and has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, for, uh, for me, it's, uh, oh, yeah. You know, you can continue, but we need to, can someone have, can bring a mic? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, you can answer yeah, and you I'll, can try and then we figure it. Uh, so for me, it's changed a bit. Uh, I'll start with, I, I don't touch uh, the materials, uh, the effects. I don't create any art content. I just use stuff, and I usually use very ugly stuff that will annoy the artist enough to make something better. <laughs> um, but uh, I used to use the, uh, the AI trees and stuff, behavior trees. Uh, I have personally left that now because we're going for a apparently a better implementation, and then, you know, let's leave it to the pros. Yeah. Uh, so I am very much just in the vanilla blueprint editor uh, creating actors. I do very little uh, level blueprints. I just make stuff. <laughs> and uh, that's, because that's also kind of what my responsibility is. And I just mix and match with the content we have. Mm -hmm. uh, also some, uh, some UMG, like if there's UI to do, I'll, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. There we have a question, really good. Uh, hi. Hey. Is this on? I don't know. Yep. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, I had a question for Michelle. Um, 
how how do you make sure that the different disciplines like uh, collaborate with each other so that like for instance the the artists don't feel left out from the programmers work or programmers don't feel left out from what the artists do because for me as an artist it feels often that you know you're in your own world and you don't even you don't even know you maybe you don't even want to know what the others are doing but it's so important so i wonder like how do you bridge this gap yeah, I, sometimes I don't want to know either. Some, some of the things <laughs> art do is very scary because I, I don't understand the materials very well. They're, they're very, very complicated in it. But um, we, t we tend to try and use Scrum a bit, a bit at hours. I mean, we're not fully doing it properly. It depends on the team that you're on. But ge generally, we just go around the departments every now and again and check that everyone's all right, see if there are any problems. I send emails out to them saying, is there anything that's bugging you? Is there anything that's affecting your workflow that we can help with? So it's, um, I mean, the studio didn't have tech design before I got there and they, they had to switch from CryEngine to Unreal Engine. So they've been going through a very big change and it was a bit difficult for them. They didn't know how to work. So I was trying to be very open with it. We, we have artists and animators will be invited to the scrum if we're working on a feature together. We have feature pages, but yeah, I generally just wander around and see if I can help anyone, see what I can do. I, mean, I can't always help, which is a bit bad when they do have a major problem that I can't actually help with. But you know, if Co can help, I'll go and book code for them for it. So. I think that it is quite easy for artists to just almost go into a silo and not emerge in yeah, Unreal. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's about the higher level management producers, the leads just going and trying to bring them in. I also think there's a little bit of question about how you set up the whole process of making the game. So we had a daily stand up uh, and we were, um, we had really light, we, we had a board, a whiteboard where we just had the tasks but they were always including everybody. So it was more like features, but very small features. So it was not like, there was not a foreign artist one card saying you have to finish the spaceship. It was more like, let's implement fighting in the first version. And then we assigned people to that. So they were a small group and collaborating. And they were always uh, a designer, a graphic artist, and, um, uh, and a programmer. So, but what also very often, and then we figured out that one of those features is actually something an artist can cover by himself. Um, and that's something I think really beautiful in, in Unreal Engine. They can go far away with that. Uh, and then you can sit down, you have something concrete, and then you put the other stuff in. So, for example, I also touched materials when I wanted to give feedback to the player like for the weapons, we wanted to have different colors for the weapons. Uh, our artist made a really nice particle effect, um, but it could only do one color. So I actually hacked my stuff in and saying, okay, now you, I have a switch. I can switch between different colors. I know it's more ugly than what you did, but now you got what it's important. And then, then he fixed it up and then we did it together. Um, so I think this kind of process encourage, and that's something I, I, really, I really like. Um, in Unreal Engine, it encourages to work together. Um, I think that also one of the things which uh, help with communication and intermingling teams is a proper sign-off process. Because I, I've worked on games where you've had designers creating a level and then art come over and suddenly oh the nav God. mesh doesn't work anymore or whatever. And sometimes if you've got a decent development, um, not milestones, phases, so you may have a white box, a sort of like a first pass, whatever. And in that white box stage is having a level setup where if this BSP is red, this is essentially gameplay critical. Art, you can now make whatever you think really pretty, but just please don't change or put anything odd in the red section. And having that sign off where everyone comes along together is just very helpful. I think, as you're saying, content teams or strike teams just really help bring people together. Um, there were more questions. Oh, you. Uh, yeah, you, you actually touched on, I think, two important things, especially for us, which is uh, the technical expertise and also the size of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, looking at Neon Giant, we are <coughs> very small, which makes it easier. Everyone you know, kind of knows what the other guy's doing because he's not far away. Uh, but uh, it, we also only have very technically oriented people, uh, designers and artists alike. Everyone knows how to use the full tools that are yeah. you know, power users. So with that in mind, artists will get involved with code as well because they want to follow up and they, they want to see it implemented in a way that 
they think is going to work because they understand it. Because I've also been in studios, and this happens very easily, that when you don't know what the guy is doing or how it works, you don't care. You just come back when it's done, and then it's not what I asked for, or it doesn't know, oh shit, we should have talked halfway, but halfway I didn't even understand what you were doing anyways, it wouldn't have helped. And we, at least, don't have that problem because everyone is kind of in the loop. You can't write the code, but we, we understand the technicalities mm. needed. So we, it just happens organically for us. It's a, it's a lucky thing, and not everyone has the luxury of hiring that kind of expertise, yeah. but it, it helps yeah. to understand. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we hired only designers with, uh, with at least some scripting background. So actually, one of our, um, when, when you applied, uh, we had one test we made, and that was uh, programming an airlock. So we give a little R2-D2 <laughs> has to move from one room to the other, and there was an airlock, and the one door shouldn't open. And they had to program that. And that was a minimum kind of understanding of algorithms. So yeah, this, so, so, but I have a question for the, for the group here. Who is working in a team with less than five people? Less than 10? OK, less than, uh, it's really bad counting I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, m more than 10. More than 20, more than 50, 100. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> so what we said before, I think this is really applicable when you split down either your game in really small parts uh, and take care of that, or you are a small team. Um, I think that's important to, to know. So when, when I see we made with a full team uh, stand up each morning, that doesn't mean with 100 people, we yeah. were actually 12. So that's maybe important. Yeah. So but we have a lot of questions. Oh um, I, I was just going to say on that point, I think that if you're going to be a small team and then ramping up or going bigger, communication is the key thing. It's not just going off. If you've not got communication in a team of 10, you're definitely not going to have communication in a team of 60. So you've got to always make sure that you have those processes set before you start expanding. Okay. Um, so I have a question exactly from the opposite side than my colleague artist <laughs> here, because I'm a technical artist, and uh, what actually happens sometimes in, in my job that uh, we have artists that they don't realize that they are doing something wrong or they could have done it better, but they still don't address it. And do you have, guys, any tips of how we could um, identify uh, issues for them straight away to help their workflow and speed it up for them. This is where having no artist on the team is not useful. <laughs> I mean, um, we've, we've got um, technical artists on um, our team as well, and they will um, sometimes attempt to do things in blueprints to make it easier for them with like color switches or adding some headlights into vehicles or some things like that, and you know, want, wanting the boots to randomly be up and down and things and um, how we handle it is we're quite happy for all the other teams to change blueprints and do whatever they want and, and learn but it has to go through a review process in our studio so they have to upload it to we use code collab and either with screenshots or we go down and do an at desk but um, they've just started they'll come to us and ask but we'll let them prototype and then we'll go down and review it and say yeah that's great I like what you've done oh by the way if you just did that it would run better or this mm. would make your graph easier and they're very willing to learn and we're quite happy to teach them if you, all, all we need to do is ask but having that formal review process there give, gives you the little push that everybody needs to actually talk to each other and to suggest improvements and I mean they, they actually do some things that we didn't know about as well that yeah. teach us good ways to do it work, especially with the material parameters and how to expose it to them and the names that they like to use rather than the names that the designers like to use. So, I mean, everyone has a different language, but just having that review process there enables it a bit more because you can tell them where they've gone wrong or tell them that, you know, if you did it this way, it half, half as less nodes and it looks easier and is more readable. They'll take that on board and they'll learn it and then they'll go and teach the next technical designer that might come and ask them how to do it. So it, it fans out from there. It's working quite well at our studio at the minute. But maybe, maybe I'm being a bit too philosophical here, but I mean, what you basically, and I agree, but what you basically saying is like, if you see someone doing something wrong, help them out. Uh, but I think that would also have to be a cultural thing, mm -hmm. that that's what we're doing. Hopefully working with people that are willing to take that and make sure that, not to go into, to, <laughs> into production, but to allow for time for not even necessarily mentoring, but it can be just a small thing and actually being able to sit down and instead of going like, 
hey, that's wrong, and then leave. Yeah. And actually being able to, to capitalize that, and if we see that this is something that happens, depending on the scope, you know, set up workshops. We, a workshop for us would just be shouting in the room. But really take the small thing seriously, but don't make it a failure to do it wrong. Make it a learning experience. I, n I don't know this sounds very high and mighty, but uh, actually make it into a good thing. Because yeah. um, uh, that's what we are trying to do, because whilst we are technical, like I said, I, I, I am not very good at the technical art side of things, as, as in performance or, or materials or any of that. And that's where I need, like, uh, my, my co-founder, who's a very talented technical artist, come in and just, like, dude, just stop, do this, and we, we work through it. And that helps me. What I also think is a little bit be aware of the capabilities of the team. So if you have some artist in, he is good in art, it's maybe a good idea to teach him at least the minimum, something like, okay, he is stud unit, and this number, when you check in, should not be higher than this. <laughs> and it, if it is, then maybe come to me before you check in, and then we figure out how to solve that. That's something we did. Uh, we, had a, we had a graphic artist who was really, he could do 2D, 3D, he could do everything. Um, so he was really, really good. Um, but he wasn't taking uh, care of if the performance is okay. So he made also, like, I did something that just for gameplay proposed, I put it in, even if it was not the most efficient way, and then I brought someone in for him, it was actually the same. And we learned from each other, and that's something I also like with the Unreal Tools, because when you, when you basically understand the material graph, and you basically, then you also can basically understand the blueprint and vice versa. So you get, you have a really good common ground for knowledge transfer, and in the long run, um, it means teaching everybody to collaborate on the same way. So I think being aware of, of, of the capabilities and giving them at least some tools. Uh, I heard from one licensee uh, uh, we had, he, he, he modified the engine in a way that um, when you put the 100th note in a blueprint, there were a pop-up saying get help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, and and so so it's about mentorship and 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 trying to to um, learn together. So there were some other question. I like that. That's really cool. That's, um, following uh, on from that, I think that essentially the reviews is it is studio culture wise in the programming background. Pretty much reviews are standard. Um, and we can try and in integrate that into our mentorship program. So if you've got two people sat together, a senior and a junior, and I've found this happens a lot, is that the junior has found a cool new feature in Unreal, which I didn't know about. And when we're reviewing code, it's like, oh, why have we done that? And it's like, oh, I didn't know that existed. And having that for design and art, I think is, it's a collaborative learning and it brings down the hierarchy a bit. Yeah. Okay, next one. So I have a question about uh, office hierarchy in the design department. Uh, for example, Michelle, you are a lead technical designer and what does it exactly mean that you are a leader and how much time you are a leader and when you are a leader and when you are a technical designer? That's a very good question. Um, so, uh, my, my team's um, six people, including myself, and I, I still spend a lot of time doing the technical design because if, you don't, if, if you're not in the engine using it every day, you'll become a bad leader because you'll come out of date with the tools, you won't, you won't have the best systems architecture because you just won't know how to do it. And you can't go around and help your team and review things and know how to set it up if you're not using it. So I still try to spend at least 70% of my time being a technical designer and the rest being the lead. So some weeks you don't get to touch it because there's just too much lead work to do, especially like during the sprint planning, the milestone planning and things because you've got to make sure everyone's got the work right, which means you don't touch it very often. But I try to stay in touch with it and still develop it. I mean, I'm responsible for the whole mission system from the technical design side currently in, in, in the game. So I've still got a huge chunk of work to do and be involved with as well. So I think it's better that way. So what, what we did for, for an, on, on our last project, we were saving time for leadership. So everybody who was, was leading a team were not fully booked for tasks, but still had enough tasks to get this. I think this is really important to keep in touch with it and not growing completely out of yeah. it and just doing... I mean, but that you cannot prevent that. So it, it depends, again, a little bit on the size of the company and what you have to, to achieve. 
Um, I did a bit of leadership for about six months where I didn't touch the code and I felt so out of touch with what my team were doing. And yeah, you've got to have that split somewhere because you, you lose touch, you actually forget how to do basic things. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, good that you try and keep that mix. Okay, any other question? I saw some more hands. I just wanted to say, I wanted to uh, reiterate the agree with the communication thing. I came from a studio of 350 plus down to 10 and assumed that everybody knew what was going on and that was a mistake, so <laughs> we had to change the culture. But I wanted to ask you of your experiences between transition between prototyping and production phase of the project. Ah, that's good. We've, we changed from putting kind of prototype pseudo assets to to actually just bright pink things so the artist knew this wasn't for final because we ended up with things in the project that probably shouldn't have been there and people put in, in pseudo finished things but weren't actually finalized so can you tell tell me about any of your experiences you had with that kind of that transitional phase from prototype to production I, no, I, well we <laughs> I still let prototype things go in because um, obviously we, we see them at review time because you know you have to else you can't you, ca you can't you can't just iterate on one machine locally it has to go in at some point right but we we tend to handle it with um, just like you would in code how you'd put to do comments in we, we, we put a nice big red comment box in with it with a to do tag on it so that we know that we need to go back and review it and sometimes it'll have more details in it like you know we'll, we'll put ones in that say this needs to move to code as soon as the designer happy with it but let's punt it to code because it's difficult in blueprint and things so we, we try to do it that way, but if you put the comments in, at least you can search for the blueprints for all the places where you've done it, so at least you can see how many are in there. Otherwise, it's practically impossible to find where you've left prototype in blueprint. But also, what, what's a prototype? Is it just the first implementation? Now, I've built some stuff that is definitely a prototype, but I've also built some stuff that it, it was just the first implementation and I cleaned it up and it's no longer a prototype, I think. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Uh, for um, <laughs> for uh, I come from an area where we did prototypes, throw them, them away, set up a new project, and then did the real thing. And with my last project, it was the same. It was somehow bleeding into each other, and we were they were a phase after we had we made a real prototype, and then we had the feeling, oh, we have something; it's working right now. So we had. The discussion: Should we now start a new project? And we say, Yeah, but it's already working pretty well. <laughs> so what should we do now? So we we had the serious discussion, and then we decided, Let's go with the flow. Um, and our main conversion from single, so we didn't had, we ended up not having one prototype. It was more like we have one project that contains different stages of uh, of features, I would say. And so we made that actually the philosophy. So in the moment we had something that was stable and felt like, oh, this is cool, it's working, then we transferred it actually in C++. Um, because we had the feeling we didn't, oh, we didn't touch this for months, this file. Let's see. Oh, this is a feature uh, about planet generation. Actually, this is pretty solid right now. We don't change it anymore. So let's take a look at it and everything that's agenda. And that means, for example, suddenly we found assets in developer folders that weren't in the cooked version. So we had this kind of problems. So we had clean up phases for single features within the big project. I would describe it like that. So I don't know how it's for you. I, uh, I tend to call features prototype until people start asking for fidelity tasks on them because <laughs> that means they're happy with it. So <laughs> I mean, my release games, I still call some of them prototype. <laughs> yeah. But isn't it also like both the, the blessing and the curse with Unreal that even like with what we have now that is good, it is probably started out pretty ugly. And it, it is the power of iteration that is so easy to just fix it a bit and a bit and a bit. And after a while, it's like, hey, this is actually pretty fancy. Like, I would never have been able to build this at first, but I definitely needed those prior iterations. Mm -hmm. And then you use uh, version handling, and you can look back. And I actually think the diff tool is pretty cool in, mm -hmm. in real. I can actually check uh, earlier blueprint versions as well. So, I mean, a, a prototype, because in my head, maybe I'm wrong, but in my head, a prototype is something you build and it, it, it's lying there and kicking and screaming, and then you leave it and you, you make another one that's better. But with Unreal, you just make it better. Mm. So it just stops being a prototype. For me, it's one of these things that I think when I was a junior programmer, I would often spend a lot of time going, okay, I've written this thing, 
oh, I need to deal with this edge case, oh, I need to deal with this edge case, oh, I need to deal with this edge case. And then you end up just dealing with edge cases. And I think at some point I reached a level where I went, hang on a moment, I'm dealing with too many edge cases here, I've done something wrong. And then I can just look at what I've had to do, step back from the problem and go, oh, actually, there's a really simple solution to this. And then restart and then sometimes start again from scratch with this new mindset. Often when we get to development, uh, get to the release stage, it's a case of, oh, I didn't think about that edge case. And then you deal with it. But a lot of the time, if you're dealing with too many edge cases, there's probably something fundamentally wrong in your initial implementation. But that's one of the questions actually we have here is a little bit the transition. So we, um, when do you put stuff in the level blueprint and when does it come systemic and when does it become C++ and when, it, when, when so do you know <laughs> how, how is this process for, for you? Uh, well, then we don't use level script. I've banned it okay. <laughs> outside of local prototype and okay. test levels. You're not allowed to use it in my studio because yeah. you end up with the same script, copy and pasted in 50 <laughs> levels, yes. and then you've got to fix 50 bugs instead of one. So yeah. we still prototype in a blueprint that you're then placed in the world because you still get the benefits of level script without the negatives yeah. of them. But it's um, there's no direct answer for when the right time is to move something to code or not, all the other way around because we do take things from code and put it back in blueprint. It's something that you do. You just have a concrete example for that. Not, I can think okay. off the top of my head, but I do know I do know that we did it because it was um, I can't remember. I'll, I'll think about it and I'll come back to it. But they're, yeah. they're, they're, it's not it's not just one way. There are things for it, but we review it at every single stage. I mean, even when we get the feature feature request, we might go, yeah, let's go that straight to code. We don't even need to prototype it. Let's go straight to code. Or we might go, let's make a blueprint prototype. We'll start making the blueprint prototype. We'll go, this is going to work better in code. So we'll make a code base class and then continue making a prototype with code and blueprint. And then when it goes to the design and we do the review and see if that's what they wanted. We'll again go, should we move it now? Should we leave it? Does it need to go? It's, it's just, we kind of do it whenever, but it's when it makes sense on each case-by-case -case process. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I, I, as I say, I really enjoyed your talk, and I think you're probably about five to six years ahead of a lot of other game studios. Well, I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I think that process you have is just brilliant. I'm not a fan of level blueprints either. And I think a lot of the time you can simplify stuff and just seeing what you had on there was like, yes, if you haven't seen it, go watch her talk. If it's recorded and available. I think it is. There was a question, right? I'll just uh, quickly touch on it as well because we, we actually align with that. We don't use, and now Alex, you can correct me if I'm lying here. He's in charge of the world. Uh, but uh, we tend to not use level boost. We use it, you know, because it, it solves a lot of problems, but that's not where it's supposed to go. And then when we, like you say, we keep reusing it. We put it in uh, the game mode or uh, in a function library or something, so we can just reuse it because you know you, it it always happens that you want to use it again. I look a lot of um, the blueprints are essentially code, um, and I look at it a lot like about 20 years ago. We were all all the coders were using C. We didn't have object, we didn't have encapsulation or object-oriented design. And so as Kismet, or Blueprints version one, um, was, well, version three, uh, was out, it was a very linear sort of uh, functional process. Um, and going into Blueprints, it's now gone on to a bit more of an object-oriented world, like C++. Uh, and so I look at a lot of these things of what Blueprints are, and and just seeing where we go in the future. And I think it's sort of maybe 10 years behind, well, 20 years behind what C++ is doing now. Okay, so there were questions. Yeah, um, I would really like to get some insights about the way uh, your teams uh, or the smaller teams, insider teams communicate and behave with each other and share information, especially for you, Arcade, coming from like bigger studios uh, what were the habits you were able to take away and bring to a smaller team? Because I found that since we're also a smaller team that a lot of ideas and tools are way too slow and take way too much time. So uh, it would be really interesting to hear. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually kind of the, the pitch for our studio. Uh, because uh, on average, everyone in the studio has 15 years experience. And uh, you know, we, we've seen it. And after a while, we just kind of got fed up. And no, first, don't get me wrong. Uh, big studios make amazing games, and they are absolutely fantastic. But we are setting out to prove that a smaller studio doing things right um, 
can make good games, but we need to remove the bloat and we re need to remove a lot of the management, a lot of what you were talking about, you lose time. A large structure needs management and, and hierarchies, but hopefully a smaller one doesn't. Ask me after we ship, we'll see if it works. But um, that was the whole thing and communication. So um, the way we solve it is that we only have people that have shipped a lot of games and have seen, they've been in the trenches uh, but we are uh, right now 10 people in the office. Every morning we do a stand-up similar to what you're talking about. It's a very classic thing. We just broadly discuss what we're doing so everyone's in the loop. We work with uh, two-week sprints and uh, after every two weeks we have a, um, like an end of sprint review and a show and tell, which is also a great way, one, for morale. It's just cool to see stuff happening. And it's also great to, oh, so that's the thing you were talking about for two weeks now that I didn't quite understand what it was. Now I see it, now I know what it is. And then people can also feedback. And then in the afternoon, the same day, we plan the upcoming two weeks and we let people plan their own tasks. So what's very important for us is that everyone is on board on what we're trying to make. So for me, what I'm trying to do is just to make sure it's like, you, you know what what we're trying to build right, good. So then you know what you need to do to help us out because you have a role here. And we only hire people that bring in competence we don't already have in the house because otherwise it's just something we could solve with more time. Uh, so it's very much letting people manage themselves because that way <laughs> uh, communication is not as important in, in the way that they don't need it to know what they should be working on. And then communication is just a plus. Um, we use uh, Slack. Uh, we use some documentation, not a whole lot. Um, we, when we started, we figured, eh, we don't need production. That's part of the bloat, right? Uh, we have one starting in May. <laughs> that was not true. Uh, that's actually very useful to have. Yeah. Uh, and that is to mainly to let me and my co-founder uh, focus more on our skill sets because we are losing a lot of time. I lose time trying to set up pensions for the staff. That's not really my expertise <laughs> and just stuff like that. So we, we, we did realize that there's a lot of admin and tracking and planning and JIRA and Confluence and Drive and stuff that just needs to be dealt with. Let's have someone else do that. You often don't notice how what a producer does or what the HR person does until they're not there, and you go, "Oh." So, in addition to the to this communication, what we also use is uh, pretty easy. We put names and blueprints. So I put some commands like to do, and then I put like Florian, and then I made a list of stuff for him, so he could actually search in all blueprints and find the stuff. What we so it became a habit between some of us, and there are actually plugins for that. So there there's also a shotgun plugin, for example, where you can really do in the editor. Uh, having the notes at the uh, at the thing what you um, what, where you are talking about. Um, Ooh, what was that shotgun plugin? Yeah. What's a, what is that? That's a plugin where you can hook up um, extra like like Jira task etc. inside into blueprints. Yeah. Ooh. I, I, could, I could show you. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. So I am as I say, <laughs> I'm a lead now. I get far too excited about task tracking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really, um, and, and, and I saw someone writing a small plugin from a company, I forgot, but they, they did something like they were a blueprint you can attach to something in the, in the world, uh, and then you had some fields you could fill out and say, here, this is for Tom, and uh, uh, I don't like the color or whatever, uh, and then there were helper functions so you could switch through all the stuff in the level, what, what was marked for you, and it was hidden in game, so you only saw that in editor. I really like that, I'm so really it's really like, like you, are, you are in this kind of metaverse uh, thing. Um, do, you, do you modify the editor or do you, use, do you add other tools uh, to make your life easier? Yes. Yes, so what, do you have an example for that? Uh, well, we made the mission system editor. We have um, added a plugin for validation into the editor so that it will warn level design and game designers when they've put an asset in that's wrong because we um, rely heavily on collections for our production levels. If it's not in the collection, it can't go in the level. So that will actually warn you when you save or open a map that 
you're using something wrong that that's not in a collection and it won't allow it to be checked in. And it's just really handy for like that. And we make a lot of visualizers for in-world in the editor so you can see what's going to happen without having to play it in the direction of flow of things. I mean, we have, we have a fan in our game that's got visualizations on it which show you which way the airflow is going through it. It just shows you when you click on it so you don't have to run it just to see it. Um, we have a lot of detail panels that we add and just um, whole editor modes. We've got a whole trigger system where you can draw any shape that you want and it will come into a trigger that will work in our, our game. That's a whole new editor mode that we added. Okay. Well, can you still upgrade? Uh, yeah, but it's difficult. <laughs> the, the programmers don't like it. We, are, um, we keep saying we're not taking another integrate and then we all beg for all the features in the next one and, and they cave in and do start integrating it for us. So, so <laughs> that is a problem. Is that essentially, if you start modifying it, the next engine upgrade is a bugger. Plugins are very handy. Yeah. And sometimes if you can sort of just separate, at least from a coder's point of view, separate a little bit away from Unreal, we have made editors which just filter out various styles of trigger boxes because trigger boxes can be used everywhere. And if you use them over the top, then it's really difficult to just to select one. So we've had like specialized ones for cameras or I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, and we've got a special editor mode which we can just toggle those. And the other one which we created, uh, sometimes it's, like it's been there for so long, I'm just wondering whether it's Unreal or we created it, um, is the ability just to deploy on platforms. So a button which just goes, run on Xbox, run on PS3, no, PS4, <laughs> um, then it will actually uh, just <laughs> boot up there. Um, and that's really helpful because it just stops with having to faff about with just the workflow of testing on the development kit. We are staying as vanilla as possible. Uh, we we say that we have the entire engine as our engine team. Uh, sorry, uh, entire Epic as our engine team. Uh, we don't have, nor do we want, the capacity yeah. to to have an engine department or that kind of tech. Yeah. Uh, the engine is amazing. Of course, there are things you know that would be nice to have. Uh, but we want to stay with the upgrades. We want to lock the version as late as possible and always stay with it. But that said, we do use uh, VWISE or however you pronounce it, the sound uh, middleware. Mm. And uh, we are always pretty quick to use the experimental features yeah. in Unreal because they're also very good and you, you kind of know that they're going to be a real thing. And uh, usually, usually things doesn't break when it goes unexperimental. Yeah. Real live, whatever it's called. So we 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 probably have every like experimental thing yeah. checked in because they're cool. So yeah. I I got a lot of signs from the back. No. We are running over time. Oh, that's so it was re it was really quick. <laughs> uh, I had really fun. So sorry that we interrupt. Now what we will hang around. Um, so here's the next panel. It's about uh, it's about art, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> yeah. So they are standing there already waiting. Um, so thanks for being here. So what we basically would try to say so. If programmers do code, if artists do art, I think game designers do data. Uh, so it's a little bit like that. So um, I, I, I also I think, think just communicate, make sure all the departments know yes. everything. So um, we are hanging around. Uh, feel free to to catch up to um, to us and maybe stay here for the panel for that. Also, Tars here are hiring, so <laughs> you know, as a way as me. well. <laughs> yeah, there we go as a dad buses. Talk to talk to one of us or someone in a Tars here hoodie and we'll give you a card. Thank you for coming, everyone. OK, thank you. No, I, I've got so used to clapping, I went to clap. Thank you.